Hi, this is Professor Cahan. Welcome to History 1301, U.S. History 2, 1877. Uh, today's lecture is Lecture 7, The Formative Years of the United States. Uh, we're going to start off this section, uh, the post-revolutionary war era, with a word. The word we're going to talk about is ethnocentrism to start off our lecture. And we're for our purposes, we're going to define ethnocentrism as seeing the world through blinders shaped by one's own culture. We in the United States tend to laugh at other countries around the globe, uh, places like Japan, for example, because they used to leave out things out of their textbook that were not flattering to their country. Places like Germany had done the same thing. But we in this country are guilty of the same sort of thing. We're guilty of this. We're uh, guilty of jingoism or uh, patriotism that's blown out of a sense of proportion. People often like to use the United States Revolution uh, as proof that we in the United States uh, have this moment of perfection. Perfection. Remember what perfection was when we talked about the uh, uh, the idea with uh, uh, with Sir Thomas More in Utopia. The idea that of a world free of sin. So from the standpoint of political sins, if you will, the Revolutionary War, the Revolutionary Era, is this moment where we are, quote, free of sin as a nation. The Revolutionary War demonstrated that Americans got together, we marched in the same direction in pursuit of a common good, and that we are devotees to compromise and constitutional principles. But we're going to look at things a little bit differently now. We're going to look at things a little bit more critically. We're going to start in this immediate aftermath of the American Revolution. And the reason we're going to use this as a talk about this as a sort of continuation is because the revolution doesn't end with, quote unquote, the Revolutionary War. If you've seen the uh, musical Hamilton, uh, there's a part in there where George III has a, has a funny little song called What's Next? And that's the problem here in this early uh, in these early days of the republic, what's next? You've won the revolution. Now what do we do? Uh, so it continues. The revolutionary period continues as Americans are going to write a document to form a government, and then they're going to write a, another document to, quote, form a more perfect union, as they put it one that will establish a strong national government that allows them to have a strong enough government to put down slave uprisings, to clear Indians out of territories, to compete with global powers like Great Britain and Spain. But before we get to that document, we've got to set the stage to see what the United States was actually like heading into that constitutional period. So to understand that, We've got to look at some of the crazy things that were happening. The United States is not the way we think of it today. Imagine if today, for example, the vice president of the United States, uh, instead of going out uh, and shooting uh, a friend or shooting somebody uh, out, of, uh, out of malice or committing a crime, what they did was they killed their closest political ally. Uh, or cl excuse me, closest political rival. Imagine if the vice president engaged in a plot to actually separate part of the nation and create a separate independent country for himself with himself set up as king. These are things that are unimaginable today, but they're the sorts of things that were happening in the new nation. So it's a different world that the United States emerges in in 1783. So we're going to try to avoid the jingoism. We're going to try to avoid the ethnocentrism in talking about this. And the best way to do this, I think, is to just kind of go in a sort of chronological order to set the stage for what's going on in the rest of the world and what's going on around, quote unquote, us. In 1781, we see a huge blow dealt against the institution of slavery. Elizabeth Freeman, or Mum Bet, as she was called, uh, was inspired uh, by a public reading of the newly created Constitution of the State of Massachusetts. She and another enslaved person, Quack Walker, were both inspired by this document that read, quote, uh, in part, quote, all men are born free and equal and have certain natural inalienable rights. And as a consequence, she, uh, Elizabeth Freeman, 
was stirred to action by this. She wound up finding a young abolitionist lawyer uh, in Massachusetts who argued before the Massachusetts courts that the Constitution re uh, eliminated the legal protection for slavery by saying all men are born free and equal. There is no legal protection to slavery. And in this case, the court agreed with Bet's attorney. Uh, Quack Walker's attorney uh, argued much the same in Quack Walker's case. Quack Walker was involved in an assault case, but the same question about whether Walker was enslaved and why he wasn't enslaved was at stake. In both of these cases, the courts ruled that the legal protection for slavery simply no longer existed in Massachusetts. Now, there's another step to this. Uh, the next logical step, since the legal underpinnings don't exist, the legislature would be free to pass a law to end slavery. However, people in Massachusetts understood that if the legal underpinning doesn't exist, then there's no reason to have slavery. So people in Massachusetts who owned slaves simply began freeing enslaved peoples on their own. There was no need to actually pass a law in Massachusetts. And by the time the 1790 census uh, was taken, there was not a single slave in Massachusetts. Now, to be fair, not all slaves were freed in the traditional sense. Uh, many were uh, wound up being converted to indentured servant contracts, but lots of them, like Freeman and Quack Walker, wound up becoming completely freed as a consequence of this court ruling. Now, this sets off a chain reaction in the other northern states. In all across the country, in the northern section of the country, states began ending slavery, but they end it in a very odd way. The way in which slavery ends in many of these cases is what's called gradual compensated emancipation. Gradual compensated emancipation. And the basic system for this, it gradual compensated emancipation existed in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. But essentially the basic way to do this was to state that we're going to have a date on which we declare all slavery to be over, meaning you can't bring new slaves into the state. At that point, at that date, those who are already over the age of 25 uh, and enslaved, they're, all, they're going to be slaves forever. Those who are under 25 are going to be freed on their 25th birthday. Now their thinking is this, why 25? Enslaved peoples, quote unquote, paid for themselves by the time they were 15, meaning the investment necessary, and you should be aware of this based on reading the price for their pound of flesh, that there's an investment part of this. That investment had paid off by the time an enslaved was 15. And the additional 10 years to take them to 25 was to give the slave owner an additional 10 years of pure profit. But since it's, quote, gradual compensated emancipation, the emphasis is on gradual. It's a slow process. So slavery ends in a very slowly and played out and drawn out way. So slow, as a matter of fact, that by the time the Civil War began in 1861, there were still a number of slaves in New Jersey. There were more slaves in Delaware, for example, uh, than there were in a number of southern states. So while slavery is technically illegal, meaning you can't bring more slaves in, there are still a number of people who are subject to slavery within those states. Now, what about the South? What does the South do about this? A number of Southerners argued that the American revolutionary ethos, the idea that all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among these are the rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, that ethos contradicts the institution of slavery. However, since these people were dependent on slavery, they were not going to simply end slavery at the drop of a hat. So what Southerners did, since they argued that this is all about property rights and the right to own and distribute property as you see fit, what they decided was they would pass laws at the, leg at the state legislative level that allowed people to free their slaves if they so desired. They could emancipate slaves if they wanted to. There would be no legal hindrance to stop them from emancipating their slaves. In 1783, 
the two years later. 1783, we finally have the Treaty of Paris that ends the Revolutionary War, the war between the United States and Great Britain. In that same year, 1783, 100,000 British loyalists are going to flee to Canada, believing that they simply are not safe. Their property nor their lives will be protected in the United States. The first hot air balloon was launched in the Royal Courtyard at Versailles, giving man the ability to ascend above uh, the ground. Uh, we also see Noah Webster publish the first dictionary of American English. And this might sound like something that's kind of silly and meaningless, but think about what it means. It's uh, not only have we literally separated via the Revolutionary War from Great Britain, this dictionary suggests that culturally now we are separated from Great Britain as well. In 1784, we see the first American trade mission opened to China. The voyages uh, of these uh, uh, to China cost American merchants approximately $30,000 in contemporary terms. They made a profit of about $120,000. Now, today, $30,000 of a cost and $120,000, that's not exactly quote-unquote big money. But what's important here is the profit margin. It costs $30,000. It made a profit of $120,000. The profits were 400% in this trade mission. Why, why, did, why would this matter? It matters because it demonstrates early on Americans understood that the future resided in commerce. Even if they have a, we have a country full of farmers, they're going to be trading those goods on the open market abroad, not just growing these things for subsistence and trade in the United States. In 1785, we see a 16-year-old named Napoleon Bonaparte graduate from a Paris military academy. Now, he was not exactly a stellar student. He graduated number 52 out of a class of 53. However, his professors all talked about how this was not a matter of intellect that caused him to be ranked so low in his class. It was a matter of challenging the intellect of Bonaparte. None of them could actually reach him because he was that smart. Uh, why I mentioned Napoleon Bonaparte, he's going to have a huge impact on American history. He's going to be not only involved in the French Revolution, but he's going to be involved in American expansion as well. In 1786, James Monroe and Alexander Hamilton wrote a joint letter to Prince Henry of Prussia, asking him to assume a new title, King of the United States of America and Protector of their Liberties. The circumstances in the United States were getting out of hand as Hamilton and Monroe saw it, and the only remedy was a strong central authority. Now, before anybody thinks, wait a minute, didn't we just fight a revolutionary war to throw off a king? Yes, the United States did fight a revolutionary war to throw off a king. But as those of you who have read the Declaration of Independence in the last section know already, the Declaration of Independence doesn't state a problem with monarchy. The problem is when that monarchy, or any government for that matter, becomes tyrannical. So the Revolutionary War isn't a war against monarchy as much as it is a war against tyranny, which is why Hamilton and uh, Monroe are capable of writing this letter with a straight face to, King, to Prince Henry of Prussia. Now, as far as Henry's thoughts on this, Henry thought so little of the offer that he didn't even bother to respond to their letter. In 1787, a convention of 55 of America's wealthiest men met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to write a new constitution. They write a new framework for the American government. In 1788, excuse me, in 1789, the first Congress convenes under that new constitution. It meets in the provisional capital of New York City. At the same moment that that Congress is meeting, while that Congress is meeting, a mob led largely by women storms the Bastille, beginning the French Revolution. 
Louis the Sixteenth again missing what's going on, much like uh, Prince Henry missed what was happening. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth wrote in his diary that nothing of consequence had happened that day, but indeed the French Revolution began on that day. Also in 1789, a French doctor named Joseph Ignace Guillotine invented a machine that promised a quote quick and painless death for all, regardless of class. Now he does this, he creates this contraption as an interim step toward abolishing the death penalty. What Guillotine truly believed was this machine that he was inventing, which would use physics to create a clean cut for beheading someone, this would make the process of execution more humane and thus ultimately convince people of the need to eliminate the death penalty. It turned out he was slightly off on that as the guillotine uh, machine becomes sort of the symbol of tyranny and repression during the French Revolution. Uh, these sorts of things are happening concurrent with the creation of the United States. So uh, the United States is coming of age, coming into being in an era that is entirely unrecognizable to the one that we are in today. Now, all of this that's going on in the rest of the world and how Americans react to it, to it leads us to a quick question right off the bat. How radical was the American Revolution? And compared to places like France, compared to China, the American Revolution is not terribly radical. It seems almost conservative. If we think, it, think of it in terms of the communist revolution in Russia that creates the Soviet Union, this is not a radical revolution. Uh, there were very few people killed outside of the actual combat uh, of the Revolutionary War itself. Again, comparatively, there were few people killed. There was little property destruction comparative to these other places. There was no storming of palaces. No reign of terror occurred. There were no dictators. There was no freeing of political prisoners. There was no real taking of political prisoners. The revolutionaries themselves don't fit the stereotype of the image of revolutionary. They were stuffy. They were solemn. They were serious and gentlemanly. They wrote pamphlets, not manifestos. Uh, they didn't uh, have causes of eliminating political oppression. They wrote pamphlets, uh, again. They didn't have causes like inequality and impoverishment, social wrongs that they were attempting to, to correct. In the United States, outside of the enslaved people in this country, there was very little class discontent within the Revolutionary War. So in as much as the Revolutionary War was not an attempt to recast the social order in this country, it's not terribly revolutionary. It's really a fight over will it be elites within England who make the rules or will it be elites within the Americas who make the rules. However, the Revolutionary War does produce a radical shift in social relationships with two distinct effects. The first is the democratization of the masses, the democratization of the masses. All of a sudden, what the masses think is going to be critical because it's going to shore up support for the big changes that people who are in charge are going to make. It's not going to be enough to say, we've got this sort of top-down social order and we're going to say, this is how it is. We're going to seek to bring in the masses and say, here, this is what we think you guys want. Here's what's in it for you to support these ideas. And then secondly, the second radical shift here is that it's going to open up the United States economy. It's going to spur the development of a market-driven economy. From the word go, the United States is going to be a market-oriented capitalist economy. No matter what any other well-meaning, well-intentioned person tells you, it's capitalism from the very beginning for the United States. How? How do we do this? How we actually do it is by looking at the impact of the war. If we look at five basic areas, we can see that the Revolutionary War changed and affected change 
throughout this country. The first impact, the first effective change is the economic area. Okay? In economics, the Revolutionary War is a critical part of this. The Revolutionary War lasts for eight years, from 1775 to 1783. Approximately one out of ten in the populace participated in the Revolutionary War. And that's uh, putting aside those who fought in the Civil War. If people contributed money to the Civil Revolutionary War effort, if they contributed clothing, if they contributed crops, if they outfitted soldiers, those were people who were, quote, involved in the Revolutionary War. So one out of ten is very high participation. On top of this, the war created a need for virtually everything and stimulated manufacturing in this country. The biggest trade partner the United States had going into the Revolutionary War was Great Britain, and Great Britain cut off all of that trade. When the United States said, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to do what you tell us, we're going to separate, Great Britain said, fine, we're going to cut you off from manufactured goods. So it stimulates manufacturing. Farmers began selling in their own right as opposed to through uh, what the British economic uh, rulers were saying. Uh, farmers sell goods directly to the vast uh, worldwide marketplace. And in order to finance all of this stuff, the Continental Congress issued $500 million in paper currency. So that's one effect, is the economic effect. The political effect in the United States uh, was... Uh, that the Revolutionary War stimulated popular participation in government. Politics had always, up to this point, both North and South, had been ruled by something called the politics of deference. Farmers, mechanics, and artisans, people who were at the lower sides of the social ladder, tended to defer to people who were at the upper echelon of the social ladder. They deferred to the planters, to the shippers, to the lawyers, to the financiers, because the thought was, since those people were wealthier and had, quote unquote, a greater stake or greater share in society, they stood to lose more if things went sideways. So you, as a poor person, should defer to these wealthier people. Well, after the Revolutionary War, and I'm not suggesting to you that this dies, I'm only telling you it declines here. After the Revolutionary War, it's for the most part, it's those poor people. It's the mechanics. It's the artisans. It's the freedmen who are the ones who are doing the fighting during the Revolutionary War. They had just as great a stake in that war. Their lives were literally on the line. So they were not as willing to defer as they were previous to the American Revolutionary War. A third impact is in the area of servitude. There's a distinct revolt against servitude after the Revolutionary War is over. Approximately half of the American population at any one time was unfree in colonial America. Now, if you remember back to the coming of the American Revolutionary War, the last thing we talked about was Dunmore's Proclamation. And I told you that heading into that, Approximately 20% or one out of every five in the United States was, quote, enslaved. So if 50% of the populace is, quote, unfree, then we've got another 30 percentage points within the population to deal with outside of slavery. So where did that other 30% come from? Well, several were the few remaining indentured servants that are still left out there. When I talked about Bacon's Rebellion, uh, I'll admit, it makes it almost sound like there's a moment where indentured servitude goes away. Now, that may be true in places like Virginia, but in other places, indentured servitude continued to be a viable economic and labor source uh, in this country. So there are still indentured servants. The overwhelming majority of people who were considered, quote unquote, unfree outside of the institution of slavery, those people were what we would uh, what we call apprentices, and apprenticeships worked differently during the 18th and 19th century. Apprentices uh, worked for a master craftsman, uh, and apprentices uh, worked for essentially the knowledge uh, 
to learn their craft. So they were paid, essentially, in knowledge. Master craftsmen were responsible for room. They were responsible for board. They were responsible for clothing their apprentices. Obviously, they're responsible for teaching their apprentices what their craft is. They're also legally responsible for things that those apprentices do. Now, by the time the uh, 17th century, excuse me, the 18th century was coming to a close, a lot of these master craftsmen were saying, this is a lot to ask of us. We're, we're paying a lot in terms of cost, in terms of having to clothe these people and feed them and take on a legal responsibility. So rather than that, yeah, we'll continue to teach them. They will still be essentially entry-level employees, but we would rather pay them wages then control them in all of these ways. So this servitude starts to go down as a consequence. The numbers of people involved in as unfree laborers begins to go down because apprentices are transitioning from this sort of unfree labor into wage laborers or free laborers. They're free to take their labor to whomever the highest bidder actually is. And it's not a coincidence that shortly after the Revolutionary War and shortly after this change in how apprenticeships work, we start seeing the first working class neighborhoods in the United States and we start seeing the first real labor actions like strikes uh, in the, revolu the post-Revolutionary War era. Now, there were several other people involved in the uh, as unfree labor and these were children who were involved in something called the putting out system. It's called putting out because the children were quite literally put out from their homes. Now, these children involved in the putting out system were overwhelmingly impoverished children. These were people whose parents were so poor that they could not afford to take care of all of their children. So what they would do is they would put out, quote unquote, their children to a wealthier neighbor or somebody who could hire them for something to teach them a trade. So through apprenticeships or teaching their children to be domestic servants of some sort, these children would get some sort of uh, an education, if you will. They would get some sort of job training, plus that family would be removed from the responsibility of clothing and feeding that child. Now, incidentally, this putting out system begins to fall into disrepute shortly after the American Revolution and shortly uh, coinciding roughly with a period called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment period held that children were blank slates, that they were perfect beings. Remember, perfect means free of sin here. So the Enlightenment era philosophers and Enlightenment era thinkers believed children were free of sin and the world corrupts them. A parent's job is to keep these children free of sin for as long as possible. And kicking them out of the house and making them go out and work for wages is certainly counter to that idea. So the putting out system as the Enlightenment era proceeded, putting out became less and less of a popular option. The next area of significant change that we're going to see here is a revolt against patriarchy. Now of all of the revolutionary change that occurred, probably none was more significant than this revolt against patriarchy. Uh, and it's worth pointing out here that patriarchy, while we like to think of it as male control over females, and for the most part, uh, most instances of patriarchy you will hear is male control over the female realm. Uh, patriarchy also means male head of households control over other males within the household. So patriarchy affects men as well. And during this era, in the pre-colonial era, before the Revolutionary War, uh, we see a huge change. In colonial America, uh, people could only get married when their parents gave them permission. Uh, now, obviously, there are exceptions. There are people who would run off and elope because they didn't want to wait for this, uh, this sort of permission. But by and large, children waited for their parents to grant permission. And parents did grant permission more often than not. But they also did it in birth order. So if younger siblings wanted to get married, they had to kind of wait for their older siblings to get married, especially when daughters were involved. Uh, there were other areas of control as well. 
Uh, there, for example, there was no such thing as dating during this period. Uh, a young lady and a young man might be interested in each other, uh, but the way, quote, dating or courting, as it was called then, would proceed is the young man would, would present himself to the young lady's parents. He would ask for permission to court her. And basically what he had to do was state his case for why he was, a, why he was good enough for the daughter. And then what the parents would do is they would, A, give permission or refuse permission. If they gave permission, they would do things like bundling the two. Uh, what they'd do is they'd take the two uh, who are interested in one another and they'd basically wrap them up really tightly in sheets and then sew the sheets together really, really tightly so that they're completely immobilized and facing one another. And that way, they're going to get to know each other really, really well because they're so immobilized, all they could possibly do with one another is talk. Okay, So that's one way. Uh, if they did go out on, uh, on excursions, if they went out on what we today might call a quote-unquote date, it was always with the girl's family as chaperones. There was very little uh, time apart from these chaperones. But it was work. It worked, and if we look at birth rates and how women gave birth prior to the Revolutionary War, we see this working very well. One of the things that we see after the Revolutionary War is a huge change. For example, women getting pregnant before marriage was very rare. Uh, prior to the Revolutionary War, but after the Revol or during the Revolutionary War, we see it starting to creep up. We see it go up to 10 to 15 percent, and then after the Revolutionary War, uh, census data indicated that one third of married women were pregnant on their wedding date. Now, how we know this is uh, families almost always gave a present called the family Bible to a couple that would get married. Uh, and in this family Bible, the whole idea behind a family Bible, it's just this enormous Bible. So some of you may see these uh, televangelists with these big Bibles that they carry around their stage. These family Bibles are enormous. They're meant to be put on a pedestal. And they are read primarily by the head of the household. He will gather the whole family together and he will read uh, a certain part of the Bible to them. They'll study it. They'll reflect on it discuss it and all of this. It's a way to bring the family together. But in the front piece of this family Bible was also a family tree. So historians have a great amount of knowledge that they've gained from these family Bibles. And one of the things that we noticed, if a couple gets married in, say, May of 1783 and then has a child in, say, August of 1783. Well, then very clearly these this couple was engaged, shall we say, before their actual wedding date. They were doing certain things and the woman was pregnant prior to the wedding date. But again, remember patriarchy and revolting against patriarchy is not just about how this affects women. We see that young sons stop waiting on their fathers to pass down property. This idea of primogeniture that I talked about in a previous class really doesn't hold much influence on these young men. Men, this is why westward expansion was so critical. A lot of these young men were saying, look, there's a whole lot of land out there in the west. Why should I wait on dad to give me this land when I can simply move west and create my own life form for myself? So sons stop waiting and they stop asking for permission to do this. Uh, and then the one way we can see patriarchy sort of uh, they're crumbling, although not completely breaking apart, is in New Jersey right after the Revolutionary War is over. Unmarried property-owning women were given the right to vote. Now, the New Jersey legislature looked at this uh, as a mistake on their part. They said that uh, voting was limited to, quote, all property holders. And since women who were not married were actually allowed to own property in their own right, the New Jersey courts said, yes, women do have the right to vote. Uh, New Jersey, however, in a later legislative session said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, uh, they said, uh, we got to make sure that these women can't vote, so let's change this to male property owners are permitted uh, to vote. But at least early on, the first couple of years after the Revolutionary War is over, 
women do have these limited rights uh, to vote in places like New Jersey. Now, another big change that happens during this era is something called disestablishment. Disestablishment is a uh, is a word that many, it seems like an easy word, uh, but many people struggle with this, especially when you have a well-meaning English professor or English teacher who will throw in something like, well, did you know that the longest word in the English language is anti-disestablishmentarianism, which makes you go, I don't know if that's true or not, and also makes you go, what the hell does that actually mean? Well, when we're done with this section, you'll know what that actually means. Every single colony and then state had what was called an established church. The churches took in taxpayer money. The taxpayer funds were used for church construction, to pay ministers' salaries, to pay for housing of ministers, all of that sort of stuff. Every single state had one. Massachusetts had one, the Congregationalist Church. Connecticut had the Congregationalist Church. Pennsylvania had the Quaker Church. Maryland at one time had uh, the Catholic Church as the established church. Virginia had the Anglican Church as the established church. Now, this didn't mean everybody had to go to church or anything like that. It was just a matter of since taxpayer funds supported the church, everybody who lived in that colony and then state, since their taxes supported the church, they were considered by default to be members of that church. But if you remember when we talked about religion at the start of Lecture 6, I mentioned to you that Americans are arguing for the freedom of religious conscience, that no one has a right to tell you how you should worship. So even though a lot of states said we think that these churches do a lot of good, the idea of saying it doesn't matter whether you believe this or what you believe or how you worship, you are considered by default to be a member of the Congregationalist, Quaker, Catholic, Anglican, whatever church. They all looked at that and said that a lot of states looked at that and said that doesn't make any sense. So we're going to do what they called disestablish the churches. So if establishment means we've established them as a function of the state, disestablishment says they're no longer part of the state apparatus. Now, every state did this after the Revolutionary War. Every state did this except Massachusetts and Connecticut. They were the two holdouts who continued the idea of having established churches. Every, everybody else got rid of them. Now, what is anti-disestablishment? Well, anti-disestablishmentarianists were people who said this was bad, this was a mistake, we should go back to having established churches. So now you know. Uh, and I'm going to leave it to you whether you believe anti-disestablishmentarianism is the longest word in the English language or not. I honestly don't know. I just know that's what one of my English teachers told me. So we've got a lot of change, a lot of social change happening in the United States. So to understand the United States during the formative years of its, of its history, we need to understand two things about it with all of this change. Change is inherently instability. So the United States is an unstable place. It's constantly changing. And because it's constantly changing, there are few, there are few very set rules. So few ground rules in place in the United States. Few things that you can say, you can count on this no matter what. And then secondly, as we've already discussed, the United States was born in an age of revolution. The age of this age of revolution, which we talked about in the previous lecture, means that there's opportunity everywhere. There's danger everywhere. It depends on how you do things, how you navigate those waters. It could be a boom. It could be a bust. It's also worth pointing out here that when we talk about this instability, political opposition is jailed. Immigrants were, te were treated as dangerous ra uh, radicals of foreign republics uh, who were uh, uh, and foreign kingdoms who were bent on destroying the United States. Uh, in short, if it were formed today with these types of rules, we'd be calling it a banana republic. Uh, we saw very little separation uh, in the minds of some people, very little separation 
between the military and this uh, and the government. Uh, the government looked at it and said the military is ours. It's not part of the civilian realm. Uh, we shouldn't. Uh, we should. We should let them. They didn't think that this the the military should be a separate entity that function uh, under civilian control. Uh, we see boundaries of the United States being unclear. We see our foreign policy being unclear. So it's a very strange place in the post-revolutionary war era. Now, the United States does not, to be clear about this, the United States does not, never does have any figures like those of the French Revolution. There's no dictator. Uh, there's no such figure like uh, Maximilian Robespierre, a revolutionary leader who eventually instituted a reign of terror in the French Revolution. Uh, his name often gets tossed around when revolutions get hijacked and go off course. And while we don't have a Robespierre figure, the United States' revolution does very nearly get hijacked and go off course. Now, to see how we get we get to this point where it almost gets hijacked and almost goes off course, we've got to look at the framework of government and look at not only the framework, but some of the dangers that the new country was facing, see how that new government was incapable of dealing with those cha those dangers. The framework for the United States' first government was created under a document called the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union, or for our purposes, uh, the Articles of Confederation will suffice. This is the first constitution created to govern the United States, uh, and it was actually created during the Revolutionary War. So it not only is meant to be a framework, but it's also how we're, uh, the, the basis for how we're going to actually fight the Revolutionary War and govern during that wartime emergency. So the U.S. declares itself independent. The Continental Congress then creates this Articles of Confederation. Now, it establishes a national government, but it's not a national government that would be recognizable to the modern American. Uh, for example, there was one branch of government. For those of you who are not up on these things, our government today has three branches. We have a legislative, an executive, and a judicial branch. Here, the only branch, the one branch of government is the legislative branch. Every single state had representation. Now, each state could have different numbers of delegates to the Continental Congress, as it was called. However, each delegation only had one vote. So effectively, these uh, states were, were uh, essentially equal uh, within the Articles of Confederation. Even if it didn't matter if a state had two delegates or seven delegates, seven was the maximum. Didn't matter if they had two delegates or seven delegates, that state's delegation still had only one vote when it came to the laws that were passed. So essentially what would happen is if a law is proposed, the delegation would get together. If the delegation voted thumbs up on the uh, on the law, then that state was considered a, quote, pass. If they voted down, they were considered a no. Uh, this Congress, the legislative branch, Congress had the power to declare war. But importantly, they did not have the power to levy the taxes that were necessary to fund that war. So they've got the power to declare it, to declare war, but they can't fund it. Instead, the power to fund it, the only power to tax, is actually in the states. The national government, the Congress, could requisition or request money from the individual states, but that was it. It was simply a requisition. A state could simply say, no, we're not giving it to you. The same with the creation of a national army. The national government, the Congress, does not have the power to create an army. They could requisition troops from the individual states, but once again, those states were free to reject that requisition. The Congress did have the power to negotiate treaties as the sole representative of the United States. So they were the sole foreign uh, uh, foreign relations area. They had the power to appoint ambassadors. 
they could serve as the nation's Indian authority because it was thought that an Indian problem in this country was a, quote, national problem, so it required a national solution as opposed to an individual state's uh, solution. Uh, nine of the state's delegations had to agree in order to pass a law. So if uh, it didn't matter whether, you know, if a state voted four to three uh, to pass or if a state had seven representatives and all seven of those voted on a pass, they didn't get seven yes votes. They got one yes vote. Uh, so all it took was four states to say no, and a law was out. Uh, in terms of actually amending the Articles of Confederation, it was even uh, it was even stronger toward the opposition. It required only one no vote in order to amend the Articles of Confederation. It required unanimous consent. Uh, on top of that, if we look at some of the other things uh, that were here, the national government had no power to draft. They could not regulate trade. There was no national court system within all of this. There was no president of the United States as a chief executive. Now, there was a person within the Continental Congress who held the title president of the United States in Congress. However, that's not the president the same way we think of the president today. Now, what all of this collectively meant, the lack of the ability to draft soldiers, no ability to regulate trade, no national court system, no president, all of that sort of stuff. All of this collectively combines to create a weak central government with virtually all of the powers actually vested in the individual states. Now, there's a very simple reason why they did this. This is not an accident. This idea of a weak central government with all of the power going out, dispersing out to those states, that's no accident. These people had just fought the Revolutionary War. They'd just been fighting a country that had a strong, top-down, dictatorial authority. A state, a head of state, that could say, this is how it's going to be, whether you like it or not. So for these people, as they saw it, that singular head of state was using that power for no positive ends. That's what tyranny was. The king of England is the sole head of state, and he's using his power to engage in tyranny. If he had used that power to for quote-unquote just ends, it would not be considered tyrannical. So for these people, seeing a top-down authority, they said, our best way to avoid tyranny is to avoid a top-down authority. Let's not allow power to concentrate at the top. Let's allow it to be dispersed out among as many bodies as possible. That way we will not have tyranny. Now, it also means that when there are circumstances where it's necessary for the nation to come together and fight a common enemy, it's going to be all that much more difficult to do. And these people are faced with it almost right off the bat. One of the first dangers this country has to face is something called a uh, the new a the Newburgh conspiracy, which is, pr from a military standpoint, likely the closest the United States had ever gotten uh, to a military coup. During the Revolutionary War, the military, the Continental Army, got very little respect from the Continental Congress, and more importantly, very little support and financial aid. Finally. In 1783, the officers of the Continental Army were angry. They were in military. They were in their winter camps in Newburgh, New York, after the Battle of Yorktown, and they got to thinking that we want our money. We have spent our money throughout the Revolutionary War. We should have been paid throughout the Revolutionary War. We should have been reimbursed for all of this sort of stuff, and we haven't been. And we want the money now. These soldiers, these officers, excuse me, got together at Newburgh and started thinking, we need to come up with a plan for getting this money. Maybe what we ought to do is we ought to march on Congress 
and just demand that they give us our money. Now, when I say march on Congress, I don't mean putting signs on a stick and marching around saying, we want our money. We want our money. What I, ta- what I mean by marching on Congress is these are, these are officers who have armed men at their disposal. So they are quite literally talking about overthrowing the government to get them or threatening to overthrow the government to get them to see it their way. The officers met, and the Newburgh conspiracy, as it was called, the meeting of these men to determine what the next course of action was going to be is the sort of uh, apex of all of this. Uh, At the center of it was a general named Horatio Gates, who was George Washington's second in command, and Gates and Washington didn't get along, but... Gates wanted to march on Congress. He was talking very openly about, you know, I believe that what we ought to do is overthrow Congress. If they don't give us our money, let's just overthrow Congress, period. But he had he didn't have everybody's support. So eventually these guys get together and say, let's have a meeting where we'll discuss all of this. George Washington makes it clear, I don't want any part of this. I'm not going to be there. I don't want to even, I don't want my name associated with this. And he rides off. And what he actually is doing, he doesn't tell anybody, but what he's doing is he rides off to meet with the Continental Congress and tell them, look, you've got an uprising on your hand. And if you don't handle this properly, they're going to march on Congress and threaten to overthrow the Congress. So what the Congress actually agrees to do, they give Washington an agreement. He'd say, he, they tell him, fine, we will give them their reimbursements if they've got uh, receipts for everything. Essentially, if they've got receipts, we'll reimburse them. And we will give them, we can't do anything about the back pay, but going forward, we'll give them what we're called half pay pensions, meaning if they were scheduled to make $25 a month, they would make $12.50 a month for the rest of their lives. So half pay pensions for life plus reimbursements. And Washington says, I think I can get them to do all of this stuff. Uh, and it makes it makes sense to many people. And Washington comes riding in. He shows up at this meeting, even though he had told these people, I will not be there. I don't want to be a part of this. And when he does, he kind of bursts into the meeting hall and strides right down to the center, uh, right down to the front of these guys and stands right in front of them. And as he's there, he reaches into his breast pocket and he pulls out the letter from Congress detailing what they're going to give these guys. He pulls that out of his pocket and he goes puts it out on his lectern and says, gentlemen, I have just come to you this moment from Congress with their response. They have heard you. They are offering the following. He takes his papers and he kind of squints at them. And then he shocks everybody. He reaches into his other breast pocket, pulls out a pair of glasses and puts those glasses on. And noting that all of these guys are going, because they can't believe that Washington has put on a pair of glasses. It's you know, during this era, for a, for a gentleman of Washington's stature, of his age and vigor, to admit to the weakness of needing glasses was something that you just didn't see. So Washington plays to the moment. and Washington says, you'll have to forgive me, gentlemen. I fear that in addition to having grown blind, gray in your service, meaning he's aged tremendously, in addition to having grown gray in your service, I fear that I have also begun to go blind. And at that point, it became immaterial what was on that paper. Washington didn't need to say another word specifically to these guys because they all got it. They all realized Washington has sacrificed as much as any of us in this room. And if he's not willing to overthrow the government, who are we to be talking about this? So the Newburgh conspiracy comes to a screeching halt. And it is literally, it's one of those few cases where it's literally the force of personality of George Washington that stops it. So this unrest with the military is there, and George Washington alone is the only force that quells it. It's certainly not the power of the quote-unquote national government. Now, independence is another problem for the country. Great Britain, Spain, France all flat out refused to respect the United States' independence, even after the war was over. In the 1780s, with the war over and a peace treaty signed, Spain and Great Britain still occupied almost one half of all territory 
that was actually ceded to the United States. They simply said, we're not leaving. We're not getting out of American territory. And this condition continues into the 1790s. The prevailing thinking here was is that the United States was not going to be able to succeed. It would fall apart like that. And so Britain was thinking, if we keep our forces here in the United States or on American territory, when the country falls apart, we'll be right there to swoop back in and pick everything up with minimal hassle. Now, Spain's claim was that... Great Britain was on the losing side. We, Spain, were on the victorious side because they were on the U.S.'s side. So if it was going to be anybody picking up the pieces, it's us, not Great Britain. So while Great Britain and Spain are fighting amongst themselves over who has the best claim to the United States, the United States is kind of over in the corner going, uh, by the way, it's our country, so maybe both of you could leave. And nobody is paying attention to the United States. So that's another problem that's going on. France also uh, felt the same way, but France was in a much weaker position. Now, another big problem here is that Spain controlled the Mississippi River. So by controlling the Mississippi River, uh, by controlling places like New Orleans, uh, the port of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, they were able to put a distinct uh, damper on American trade. Given this, it shouldn't surprise you to find out that another problem that the U.S. has in this post-revolutionary war era is that the economy is just kind of falling apart. Uh, it's particularly bad in parts of the South, in both Georgia and in South Carolina. Approximately one-third of the enslaved population self-emancipated. They ran away. They heard Things like Dunmore's Proclamation, they heard the idea of rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and said, rather than taking Dunmore up on his offer, the hell with this. We'll just run away, and we'll be free regardless of what we do. So a third of the, popul of the enslaved population of those two colonies and then states runs away. And the populace in both of these states feared that slavery was going to break down. They hoped that it might recover, and it turned out that they were right, it did recover. But the fear there was that slavery was going to break down. And if slavery breaks down, what type of labor force is there out there uh, for us in the South? Now, Great Britain also winds up harming uh, the remainder of the American economy. They maintained uh, the trade embargo on the West Indies. They said, the United States is not allowed access to trade with any West Indies uh, ships from the West Indies, and they are not welcome in West Indian ports. So all across the Caribbean, uh, the United States has cut off. Those vessels that are coming out of the Caribbean are not allowed to go into, uh, for example, New England ports. Uh, so all of those uh, places in New England, for example, that were dependent on those ships coming in and dependent on uh, trading codfish or uh, taking off the molasses and sugar and trading rum with them. All of that stuff is causing a huge economic problem for them. Uh, so the United States is in real trouble. And then on top of that, because the economy is collapsing, uh, the United States is simply, the uh, in virtually every state, they're simply issuing paper money. They're issuing more and more and more paper money. The national government is constantly borrowing money from private banks because they don't have the ability to manage the nation's currency supply. So the United States has a national debt right at that moment of $160 million, which, again, in 2020 doesn't sound very high, but $160 million in 1783, 84, 85 is an enormous debt. Congress had what they believed was the answer to this. They were going to pass a small tax increase that would be dedicated specifically to paying off this national debt. However, uh, Rhode Island said they would never agree to a national tax, and that was that. Because remember, in order to amend the Articles of Confederation, it took unanimous consent. So one state can stop it. 
Now, following this, the worst case scenario is what happens if people start to riot and there's mob uprisings. And given that that's what I'm telling you, it, you should figure it out. Mob uprisings and rioting does start to occur. As this economy continued to decline throughout the 1780s, creditors, the people who are actually owed money, begin to wonder if they're ever going to be repaid for all of these debts. Now, the people who were most in debt were farmers. And the reason for this is very simple. Farming requires a fair amount of debt. Uh, you have to borrow money in the season, uh, in the planting season, to get through the growing season. And then when you harvest your crop, you take that crop to a farmer takes that crop to marketplace, sells it off, and with whatever money they make at market, they pay off their debts and hopefully have enough money to start the next season. If they don't, they've got to take off and take out another loan. So farmers are almost always in debt as a consequence of the structure uh, of farming. However, they wind up being in debt for another reason. This is because of high taxes. And when these farmers are in debt, the answer from the creditors, the people that they owe the money to, the answer is very simple. You foreclose on the farms because all of these debts are backed by these people taking out mortgages on their farms. So how did they get into this position? It's actually pretty simple. Massachusetts and, and Virginia, to be fair, but Massachusetts is the one we're going to be dealing with right now. Massachusetts and Virginia both said after the Revolutionary War, we're going to be very aggressive in paying off our state's Revolutionary War debt. We're going to pay it off in three years. And the Revolutionary War officially ends in 1783. And both of these states by 1786 had actually succeeded in paying off their Revolutionary War debt. But they did it by taxing the hell out of people. Massachusetts, for example, paid off their Revolutionary War debt within those three years by increasing property taxes, increasing those property taxes to nearly 60%. 60% is the rate that these uh, properties are being taxed at. So think about it. In the modern world, a 100000 in Houston, for example, in 2020, a $100,000 home is not an enormous house. But if it's got a 60% property tax rate, that means even if you've paid up your mortgage, even if the, there's no mortgage owed, the person who owns that house has to pay $60,000 in taxes every single year or they lose the property. They get foreclosed on. So... Not only are farmers losing their land because of foreclosures related to debt, they're losing their farms because of foreclosures related to the property taxes. And they are angry about this. They start looking at this and saying, these taxes by the state of Massachusetts are the same types of taxes we fought Great Britain over. This is tyranny, this massive amount of taxes. Now, they're not saying taxation without representation. They're simply saying the tax itself, the amount, is tyrannical. And we cannot sit by and let this go on. So the farmers demanded property tax cuts. Uh, they demanded that the state legislature change all of this stuff. They demanded uh, what were called stay laws, meaning that the government step in and say, we're going to halt the payment of debt until the economy recovers, or until these people have more money, or until whatever when it comes to stay laws. Now, the Massachusetts legislature actually succeeded in passing a debt relief law. Said we're going to put stay laws in place and all of this stuff. But the creditors twisted the arms of, the upper, of members of the upper house, and they killed all of this stuff. So the people in Massachusetts believed we have no choice but to revolt against the state. Now, how are we going to revolt? Daniel Shays, one of these farmers and a Revolutionary War veteran, came up with a very simple answer. His solution to all of this was foreclosures are done by the courts. So it's very simple. We stop the courts from meeting. We stop the foreclosures. So if you think the idea of an Occupy movement is something new, it's not. It's something that's happening during Shays' Rebellion. They're literally occupying the courts. They're going in with sticks 
and with what amount to bats. They aren't little, literally called bats at this point. They've got pitchforks. They've got clubs, all this sort of stuff. And they're basically telling these judges, we're going to beat the crap out of you if you try to issue a foreclosure. And virtually all of the judges said, the heck with this. This is not worth my safety. Court adjourned. And they don't issue the foreclosures. So they were, it worked. The, tax, the courts get shut down. Ultimately, the governor of Massachusetts says, this is not acceptable. We're not going to let this happen. You guys are judges no matter where you are. That means you have your judicial powers wherever you are. So effectively, he says, I don't care if you're sitting in a coffee house. I don't care if you're sitting in a bar. I don't care if you're sitting at your kitchen table. You need to be issuing the foreclosure orders. So the judges say, okay, they start doing it. And since for the most part, they're saying, I'm just going to do this at home. Shays and his rebels say, fine, we'll attack you at your homes too. So they go to these people's houses. They evict the judges. They pull the judges out of the houses. They beat them up. They hang them in effigy. They burn their houses down. And now the government of Massachusetts reacts by sending out a militia. Now these militias are comprised of locals within the populace. It's not a national army or anything. The militias are drawn from local populaces. So a lot of these people in the militia know the very people that they're being asked to put down in Shay's Rebellion. And they're a little bit ambivalent about all of this. They're not happy about all of this. Now, this event terrified people. As all of these tax rebellions are happening in Massachusetts, this re rebellious spirit spreads, again, throughout the South. And while ultimately Massachusetts puts a stop to this by saying we are going to pass state laws and all of this, a lot of people within the upper levels of society, a lot of elites, were terrified by all of this stuff. They were very worried, just like they were during Bacon's Rebellion. They're terrified for a different reason, but they're really worried. They believed that guys like Shays and his followers had been dangerous radicals. For example... Samuel Adams, the guy who created the Sons of Liberty during the Revolutionary War, which you know create, which started the Boston Tea Party and all of this other stuff. Daniel Shays and his people consciously compared themselves to the Sons of Liberty, but Samuel Adams wasn't having it. When, Sa when Daniel Shays was arrested and then ultimately sentenced to death and the governor said, I'm pardoning him and I'm set setting aside the death sentence, Samuel Adams said the following, quote, Rebellion against a king may be pardoned or lightly punished, but the man who dares to rebel against the laws of a republic ought to suffer death. So he believed the governor of Massachusetts had betrayed him, not the revolutionary spirit. Shays was in every way wrong, according to Samuel Adams. Now, while many of the revolutionary generation felt the way Samuel Adams did, one of the exceptions was Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson about was moved to write about Shays' Rebellion, and he said the following, quote, A little rebellion now and then is a good thing. It is a medicine necessary for the sound health of government. God forbid that we should ever be 20 years without such a rebellion. Now, many critics of Jefferson argued that it was easy for Jefferson to take this type of an opinion because Jefferson was the United States minister or ambassador uh, to France, so he was, you know, kind of safely away from all of this stuff. But Shay's Rebellion is scary for another reason. Shay's Rebellion shows what happens when people at the lower classes and at the lower piece, parts of the social ladder, what happens when they start demanding control? They threaten the existing social order. So while we don't have a reign of terror, while we don't have these massive amounts of political prisoners, here is where we do have a confluence of sorts with the French Revolution. Now, before we get to that, I want to talk about what the solution in the United States was. The solution, given that all of these people were scared half to death by what Shays and his followers had done, their answer was very simple. The national government as currently constructed is too weak to deal with these types of problems. So we need a stronger national government. We need a stronger system of government. So we need to take the Articles of Confederation and at minimum 
fix them, quote unquote. So the creation of the strong central government, which results in the cre- the writing of the United States Constitution, the same one that we still operate under today, that's the end result of Shays' rebellion. But back to uh, revolutions for a moment, the confluence with the French Revolution. The French Revolution had a period in it called the Thermidorian Reaction. And many political scientists have argued that the writing of the United States Constitution was a Thermidorian reaction. And you'll hear a lot of uh, very erudite political scientists talk about the Thermidorian reaction, but they don't always explain it. So here's what happens uh, with the Thermidorian reaction. Uh, During the French Revolution, the people who started that revolution uh, believed that that they were starting over from scratch, that everything was beginning anew. So they, we look at revolutions and we say, as political scientists and historians, a division within the ruling elite occurs in every revolution. That's stage one. The, stage, the first stage is what actually allows a revolution to happen. In our case, in the United States' case, it's all those people who were fighting, who were arguing about whether the Proclamation of 1763 or the Quartering Act or the Stamp Act or the Townsend Duties or the uh, or all of those other laws, whether they were legitimate or not legitimate. Okay? The British elite said, yes, they were. In the Americas, there was a, 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 an elite that said, yes, they were, and in a group of elites that said, no, they were not. So the division within the ruling elite is what allows the revolution to occur. Step two in every revolution is when every other group within society gets politicized. The elites are going to try in this particular stage to appeal to the middle classes and to the lower classes because of an understanding that a, that a revolution can't occur solely among the elites because they just don't have the numbers. That's why they appeal to the middle classes especially because the middle class is so called because it's there's just so many people within the middle class step 3 or stage 3 in every revolution is where a state a struggle for power occurs among all of the social classes now depending on who's in charge in that in a particular moment it determines what direction the revolutionary period is going to to go in if it's led by the ruling class if it's led by the elites it's going to go down one road, if it's led by the most impoverished in society, it's going to go down a whole different road. Stage four is the most interesting. It's called the Thermidorian reaction. During the Thermidorian or during the Thermidorian period in the French Revolution, the French revolutionaries had gotten together. They said, "We're starting over from scratch. We're starting all of society over. We're abolishing Christianity. We're abolishing private property." They said, "Since we're starting over, we're abolishing the calendar." We're going to start at year zero. Now, this is in 1792. They declare we are at year zero. It's a whole new era. And then they said to make sure that everybody understands we're in a different era. We're going to re. We're going to come up with a whole new system of names for the months. A whole new conception for the months. So, we're making everything new. But there are always those who oppose. There are always people who look at this stuff and say, you guys are not taking us down the right road. And those opposition people fight. And revolutionaries during this Thermidorian reaction, or leading into the Thermidorian reaction, were convinced that those counter-revolutionaries, those people who opposed the creation of the new order, that they were enemies to the state. And that they had to be liquidated. They had to be gotten rid of. And so they wind up arresting more than 300,000 counter-revolutionaries. They execute 25,000 of them in what was called the Reign of Terror in France. Now, eventually, the revolutionaries started getting really paranoid and started calling everyone enemies of the state. And finally, in July of 1794, or... In the month of Thermidor, in that year two, in these people's new conceptions, a coup of conservatives overthrew the revolution. They said the revolution has become too radical. It's gone off track. 
and we need to rein it in and put it back on track. So whenever we see in every revolution a moment where conservatives, small C conservatives, look at this revolution and go, it's gone off track. We need to rein it in and get it back on track. Whenever you have that type of conservative backlash, a revolution is said to have a, quote, Thermidorian reaction. And in the United States, the Thermidorian reaction is the writing of the new constitution. So join me for the next lecture, lecture eight, where we will be discussing specifically the new constitution of the United States.